Calculus. Calculus is divided into integrals and derivatives, and the fundamental theorem of calculus actually links integrals and derivatives in a fun way. What we're going to explore in this video is that rather than just the normal integrals that we've been dealing with, we're going to take line integrals, area integrals, and volume integrals, and see how those wind up relating to the derivative. Physics takes math to model reality. So let's take something that will allow us to uh, model the fundamental theorem of calculus, or use the fundamental theorem of calculus to model a car traveling down the road. So if we have a little car driving along some road at some velocity, v of t. Now this of t is actually really important because what we're doing is we've got a velocity that's changing with time. If we want to find out how far the car has gone, we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus, where we can actually express dv dt as the derivative of position, which itself depends on time with respect to time. How far we've traveled is going to be the sum of how far we've moved in some interval delta t. So this is how far it goes in some delta t, and of course, in the limit where this becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, this becomes dt. So relating the velocity to how far we've traveled, we are integrating from some point A to some point B, and of course this is going to be v of t dt. It's the sum of all the little tiny intervals of time times how far we've traveled. Now because these are actually times, we could have t initial, t final, but we'll just go ahead and leave them as a and b. Taking this expression and substituting it in, we can see that we now have the integral of a derivative with respect to time, which we integrate with respect to time. Integrating from a to b, well, we can do this. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is equal to x evaluated at b minus x evaluated at a. And there is the fundamental theorem of calculus. We've looked at the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, let's look at the fundamental theorem of gradients and see what we notice. We're going to take an integral from a to b. Note that unlike with the fundamental theorem of calculus where these were just constants that were scalars, these are constants that are vectors. So one particular point in space to another particular point in space. And we're going to take this integral of the gradient of t, which is a function of x, y, and z. And of course, we don't have to do this in Cartesian coordinates. This is true in general, but I think in Cartesian for the most part, so that's the way I'll write it out. Because this is a vector, we'll go ahead and dot that with a dl. What we're doing is we're adding up all of the little dot products between this dl vector and the gradient of this scalar field. When we add all of those things together, what we can say is that this is equal to t evaluated at b minus t evaluated at a. It looks just like the fundamental theorem of calculus. There's another nice thing though, because this is some path, if a equals b, we can have some closed path And if a equals b, then we're just saying that t of a minus t of a will wind up being zero. Now, this is going to have deep, deep physical implications. We've seen the fundamental theorem of calculus, and we noticed 
that when we had the fundamental theorem of calculus, it looked an awful lot like the fundamental theorem for gradients. We're going to go a little trickier now, and we're going to do curls. If we wind up having the integral over some surface of the curl of some well-behaved vector function v, well, this is going to be some region of space, some surface, so this is now going to be an area integral. And once again, this is a vector and this is a vector because the curl of a vector field is itself a vector field, and our dA is going to be a little infinitesimal piece of area, and we take the dot product between those two things, and here we have our area integral. Okay. The curl gives us the circulation, how much is flowing around. So if we have our region of space, which looks like this, we can divide our region of space up into little tiny pieces. These little tiny pieces don't even actually have to be the same size nor do they actually have to be the same shape. So this piece is a little different. What our area integral is doing is it's evaluating this curl for each of these and then adding the whole area up. Now, here's the tricky bit. Because the curl is the circulation, that's the amount that's going around. So if we have some little piece in here that is going around this way. This little piece right here will also be going around this way. And what we notice is that this piece right here is going up, and this piece right here is going down, and they're vectors. And because they're vectors and they're infinitely close together and it's the same vector field, they're going to have to be equal and opposite. And because they're equal and opposite, these two just become one bigger one. Well, we could add another one to that. This one is going this way. And if we look at our little box right here, this one is going to be going like this. And what that means is that we can erase these two pieces as well. So now we have a mess, but we have one big L-shaped thing. Well, it's, it's immediately clear that what we've got to do is we've got to now get this square into the game. And then it's sort of like the blob. We can add this square and 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 this square. And, this square. and as we're doing this, our curl is canceling everywhere right up until we hit the boundary. As soon as we hit the boundary, we no longer have things to cancel. Since we don't have things to cancel, our curl will wind up being just along the outer boundary of our surface. So what this means is that the curl dot dA, so we integrate the curl dot dA, this winds up being v dot dl over some closed loop. So what's our closed loop? Our closed loop is the outer loop here. What is this v dot dl? Well, dl is the vector that is pointing along this infinitesimal distance, every place along our surface. What we're summing up is the dot product between this vector, dl, and our overall vector field, v, that's happening at this place. 
So we add up v.dl here to v.dl here, v.dl here, v.dl here, and all of that gives us what the curl of the whole area must be. And that is Stokes' theorem. Note, once again, we are evaluating the integral of a derivative, and what we're left with is our function evaluated at our bounds, just like it was for the gradients, just like it was for the fundamental theorem of calculus. We've talked about the fundamental theorem of calculus, the fundamental theorem of gradients, and the fundamental theorem of curls, which is called Stokes' theorem. Now we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem for divergence, known as the divergence theorem, Gauss's theorem, or Green's theorem. I guess it's so important that it needed three different names. The actual theorem states that the integral of some well-behaved vector function v that we're taking the divergence of and of course, because we're taking the divergence of our vector field, this now becomes a scalar field, so we can take the integral d tau. Note this is not a vector, and there's no dot product here. When we had the fundamental theorem of calculus, we evaluated the derivative to be just our original function, our two endpoints. When we had it for gradients, we evaluated it, and it was our function, original function, evaluated our two endpoints. Stokes' theorem, it was the area became the outside bounding curve. And now that we have a volume, it's going to be the bounding surface. So we now have a surface integral of v dot dA. So while this is not a vector, this is, which is why we have to have this dot product. So why does it work that way? Recall that the divergence is the amount that's flowing out. If we have some generalized funny shaped object. So we could have some object and you have to use your imagination a little bit. This is a this is actually a three-dimensional object. So it comes in and out of the board. And what we're going to do is we're now going to divide this volume up into little cubes. So looking at this little cube right here. And this little cube is, of course, going to be some volume element, d tau. Now, our little cube is going to have a divergence. And the divergence is going to be the amount coming out here, 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 and front and back, and so forth. Because the divergence is what flows out. If we have this box, we note that there happens to be another little box right next to it that also has its own little arrows. So we have another box with another set of divergences coming out of each of the sides of the boxes in front and back and so forth. Ah, but because it is a well-defined, well-behaved vector function, v, that means that because these are two infinitely close together boxes, the divergence, if it's positive here, must be negative here. And if it's positive here, it must be negative here and the same value. So when we put those two together, Kapow! They go away. And these two infinitesimal sized boxes become one slightly larger box. And while these canceled out, all the divergence on the surface is really just the vector function at all those points. If we were to then notice that there's not just a box over here, but there's also a box down here, as well. And of course, that box has all the same arrows. So we would add in another set of divergences. Now I'm putting arrows, which makes you think of vectors. They're not actually vectors. What they are is just the amount flowing out. So we have an amount flowing out here, an amount flowing out here, and here, and here. And there's front and back as well. And of course, these two together wind up being exactly equal and exactly opposite. So Kablooey, they go away, leaving us with now this kind of funny shaped box. With divergence happening 
at all of the surfaces. So there's nothing special about cubes. We could have whatever tessellates together, whatever fits together. We could, we could add more this way, we could add more this way, and we keep going, and all of these arrows, kapow, 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 keep winding up, canceling out until we get to our surface. So all of these volume elements cancel, 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 cancel. But as soon as we hit our surface, now we wind up having a divergence that is going to be the value of our function at every point along our surface. And then there is some little area A, which can be thought of as one of these little tiny surfaces, dA. And when that's sitting on the surface, in order to get the scalar amount, we take the dot product between our dA vector and our vector function at this point. That gives it to us for this, and then we can add this up for all of these arrows all throughout the surface, meaning we need an integral of v dot dA. This video has shown that there is a deep relationship between the fundamental theorem of calculus, the fundamental theorem of gradients, Stokes' theorem, and the divergence theorem. In each case, we evaluate the derivative of a function, integrate that, and then what we wind up doing is we get that function evaluated at the boundaries again. This has deep, deep implications for electricity and magnetism. What it means is that we will be able to measure or describe our function, our electric field or our magnetic field or our electric potential at the boundary of some surface and tell what's happening all the way throughout. These theorems will come up again and again throughout your study of electricity, magnetism, and physics in general.